which was accompanied by weight gain, appropriate weight gain. So um, there have been times when they've said you gain weight from the drinking milk, and, and currently they're saying you lose weight from the drinking milk. And, uh, but certainly drinking milk isn't the reason. It's soda. And then the soda people tell you it's something else. And eventually, a lot of people are pointing their finger at sugar. Sugar is the problem. So we have all the sugar-free stuff. But let's look at what is carbohydrate a little bit and see where the fingers maybe should or shouldn't be pointed. And if we're not pointing fingers, perhaps we can at least draw some logical conclusions based on the evidence provided. There are three classes of foods that provide us with calories. Carbohydrate, protein, and fat. I uncovered proteins earlier today. I'll do fats in two more days. Until then, we're going to stick with carbohydrates. Those are the only three sources of calories. Well, of course, in there was a time where fat took a pretty bad rap. And so the companies that had, excuse me, had fat in their product, but, but they didn't want to seem like it, they started saying, actually, we're a no-fat product. There's no fat, zero fat. Have you seen that on the label? Zero fat. If you read the label, you find out it has oil. Well, oil is just liquid fat, but fat is solid oil, and, or, and usually we determine
determine this all at room, based on room temperature. So in a sense, you could, you weren't telling a lie if you had something that is an oil at room temperature into your food and say, no fat. But try and tell that to your system. Your system doesn't read. Your biochemistry says, this is fat. I know what to do with this. Put it into storage. <laughs> we can't store carbohydrates. Can't store carbohydrates. Can't store protein. But we're really good at storing fat for another day. However, carbohydrates are utilized in all of our cells as the preferred fuel for every cell of the body. And carbohydrates are utilized in the, in the creation of many of the different substrates that the body produces. And so you find carbohydrates in seminal fluid. And you find carbohydrates in places pretty much anything you check in the body going to have some carbohydrate in it. But we can't store it. We need a steady supply. It's sort of like oxygen. There's a little oxygen in you at any given time. In fact, you can use a pulse oximeter, that little thing they stick on your finger. You know, you see it in a lot of the medical shows now. It's becoming more commonly used. And if you stick a pulse oximeter on the end of your finger, what it tells you is how much oxygen is in your blood. It's actually a blood oxygen saturation meter. So there's oxygen in your body, but you have to keep breathing, don't you? You can't store it for like an hour and a half from now. You've got to keep the supply coming in. And the same thing with carbohydrates, except except that that functional level is, is on a slightly longer time scale with carbohydrates than it is with oxygen. You have to take in oxygen every few minutes, whether you want to or not. Carbohydrates, the functional level, gives you enough carbohydrates so that if you didn't take in any more you'd be good for an easy 18 hours. Easy. You might get even a little longer than that, depending on what you do and how you're built and how various things. But you still have to take in more daily or you feel like you're out of it. Your body starts telling you to look for them. What is carbohydrate? Anybody have any chemistry that can help me? I mean, it's got some some pretty easy yeah, it's got some pretty easy names in there coming from chemistry. There's carbon, there's hydrogen, and because it's hydrate, it's also got some oxygen. In fact, the word hydrate has come to have meaning for many of us. We understand that when we hydrate, we take in water. So basically we're talking carbon and water. Being carbon-based organisms, that works pretty well for us. I've watched television. Probably you have too. <laughs> There's a guy who comes on television and he calls himself the juice man. And he sticks everything into his juicer. He makes juice. Did you ever see him juice rice or toast? How much juice do you think you get out of toast? I don't think much. Where is the hydrate portion in these 
foods touted as carbohydrate, hmm. it's actually there, but it's tied up. It's tied up in, you know, in a complex enough structure that it's almost impossible for us to get out of it. It's almost impossible because we don't have the digestive enzymes to break down the complex carbohydrates into their simpler components. It turns out we do produce exceptionally small quantities of the amylase, we call ptyalin, the digestive enzyme that helps us break down starch, we do produce a tiny amount of it. So for instance, if you're out and about walking the jungle, you see a bunch of bananas hanging from a plant. You say, oh, I'm going to remember where that is because when they come right, I want to eat some of those bananas. Mm -hmm. And then a monkey goes by up in the trees and he spots his bananas and he goes, <laughs> I'm going to remember. And then the wasps come by and the pesote come by. And pretty much everybody else comes by and says, those are my bananas. <laughs> when they come right, I'm going to eat them. <coughs> and the bats come by. And they say, all those guys are going to compete for those ripe bananas the day they come right. I'm going to have them the night before. <laughs> And the ants go, we can get them sooner than that. We don't care. And there becomes a certain stress, if you will, a bit of competition for the banana or whatever the piece of fruit is. And in the end, you go, if I'm going to get any of those bananas at all, I think I'm going to eat them maybe a day or even two before I normally would if I could just leave them in the privacy of my own space without the bats and the rats and the cats and everybody else coming and eating my bananas. And the monkeys, the monkeys will literally peel the shingles off your roof. <laughs> the raccoons will walk right through screen doors or nibble through. The rats will eat the walls to get into your house if you're storing fruit there. <laughs> we think we're well constructed. The orangutans are so, I mean, picture creatures our size five times stronger than us. And they just go, Phew! they just open your house without <laughs> using doors. <laughs> and so we eat the fruit a little early. Who's ever eaten a banana just a little early? Probably everyone. <laughs> you have enough salivary amylase to deal with it. Who's eaten a banana earlier than that? And found out you didn't have enough salivary amylase <laughs> to turn that into food. Because it was complex carbohydrate. It was actually a, specifically kind, a specific kind of complex carbohydrate, somewhere between a short and medium chain, known as an oligosaccharide, if you ever want to wow your friends. Scrabble game. <laughs> That'll get them. Oligosaccharide. That's got to be worth it. I don't think all of act like fits on a scrabble. <laughs> it's pretty close because I think it's only 15 across or something. 
<laughs> Human beings do not produce at all the digestive enzymes required to break down oligosaccharides. Hence, any foods that contain them result in fermentation of those starches because we couldn't digest them and so they go off in our intestines because it's dark and wet and warm in there. I mean, it's perfect vat for fermentation. What do you produce when you ferment carbohydrates? Alcohol and gas. As they say, the alcohol is no good for you, the gas is no good for everybody else. <laughs> but it turns out that it's an odorless gas. So it's not one that they really mind. The one they really mind is the one that's coming from protein. The sulfur rich fermentation is coming from protein. When we break down the starches from fermentation, we end up with a lot of gas. Want to take any guesses on perhaps what other foods might contain a lot of oligosaccharides? Beans. Did I hear beans? Beans. You eat beans, you get results. Oligosaccharides in mature beans. Anybody else know what's in mature beans besides oligosaccharides? Field mature beans? Protein. Sorry? Protein. Protein. Fat. 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 Carbs. And? Fat. Arsenic. <laughs> Arsenic. We're not really set up to eat field mature beans. Arsenic doesn't take a lot make you very, very ill. How do you get rid of the arsenic? You soak it out. If you soak beans for 24 hours or you cook them out, you can break down, boil off whatever the arsenic. But don't recommend trying field mature beans. You can't break it down with the oligosaccharides, but you can release the arsenic. Great combination. You have arsenic poisoning and gas. <laughs> coming out both ends at that point because you got projectile vomiting for sure with arsenic poisoning. So complex carbohydrates, we don't have the digestive enzymes to break them down. If you want to know how much amylase you produce, try a teaspoonful of cornstarch. See how long it takes you to deal with even a teaspoonful of starch. Do we produce more salivary amylase than orangutans or chimpanzees? Yes. But we produce hardly any. They produce even less. They like eating ripe fruit, and they're pros at it. They're out there all the time. How long do you spend looking for fruit? They spend all day. We just can't feed them. And they'll fight for it if they have to. In order to consume complex carbohydrates effectively, we must break them down through the process of cooking. Last I checked, nobody else on the planet is cooking except for us. With nobody else cooking, it's hard for me to accept the idea promulgated by various health professionals that we are naturally starch eaters. Starch eaters by nature. We are not starch eaters by nature. We don't have the digestive enzymes who break them down. And they don't taste good to us. There are creatures that do eat complex carbohydrates naturally. Typically, they have multiple stomachs. Mm -hmm. Typically, at least three or even four. And 
they often don't produce the enzymes to break down the starch either. But what they do, especially the ruminants do, is they eat the food, bring it into a stomach, regurgitate it a bit, bring it into the next stomach, and in there it can ferment. And then they can, which means it's being broken down by bacteria, and then they can access the complex carbs because they've been converted into simpler carbs. Simple carbs are so called because their structure is simple. Their chemical structure is simple. But we can differentiate complex carbs from simple carbs by the simple fact or the fact that simple carbs always taste sweet. On the tip of your tongue, if it tastes sweet, it's a simple carb. We call those sugars. And all of them end in the same three letters. O-S-E. Pretty much, if you see a word in biochemistry that ends in O-S-E, it's referring to a sugar. If it ends in O-L, what is it? It's an alcohol. If it ends in an O-N-E, what is it? It's a hormone. Testosterone, aldosterone, and on through. If it ends in OSE, it's a sugar. But only in biochemistry. These are technical terms. Obviously, fire hose and pantyhose are not sugars, <laughs> even though they end in OSE. But those are not biochemical words. So it, it can get confusing because technical words often find their way into other technical languages and mean different things, like virus in medicine, slam found its way into computers, but they don't really mean quite the same. They're not the same thing, but they have okay, usage. And then you can get into, into sciences or fields that are not necessarily technical, but that use the same words, and you can create more confusion. Words such as fruit, which means one thing to a botanist and something completely different to a chef. We're looking for those sugars to be available to us because the complex carbohydrates truly are not. Not without some major league processing and cooking, all of which reduces the nutritional hit dramatically. Meanwhile, you still end up with a complex carb, which, by experience and definition, has no taste. It is a tasteless substance. But these carbs have to get to our cells, because all of our cells are fueled by complex carbs that we can't store, but we do have a functional level within our body. There are carbs in there, you could almost think of it as storage. But it's not. It's a how many gallons does your car take in its tank? Fifteen roughly? I got a hundred gallons of gas available. It was gifted to me by a friend. I have no containers of any kind. Can I pour it in your back seat? <laughs> that wouldn't really be a functional way. You can't store more then your tank holds. The tank is just a functional level. It goes from 15 gallons down to zero. Well, 
other people's tank might be 20. We have different sized tanks, but, but an extra thousand gallons poured in the back seat would probably be a problem. It would, in fact, spill out or spill over, wouldn't it? This is the exact same terminology used by medical doctors for what happens to sugar in our bloodstream when we consume more than we can utilize at any given time. Some of it will be converted into fat to be stored because that's all we can store. It's our only calorie source that we can store. But some of it will actually be processed by our kidneys and just go, man, there's just like way too much sugar in here. Too much sugar in the blood, let's get it out and it will spill over into the urine. Who's heard that term? Okay, it's, it's a spillover. We don't want that to happen. What would be the point of eating fuel just to, have, just to pee it out? No, no advantage there. Simple sugars are alluring to us. They taste great. There's an appeal there. But we can't store them any more than we can store complex sugars. But we have sugars in our body being used in various forms. For instance, in the bloodstream, did you know there's sugar in the blood? You know what it's called? Blood sugar. It's called blood sugar. It's not a highly technical term. It's called blood sugar. If you're on a fast for 20 days, no food, all the water you want, no food, 20 days, people have done that. Do you think they've used up all their blood sugar or do they still have some? What do you think? Are you going to go like ketosis? Yeah. They've used up all their blood sugar, do you think? Well, no, they break, they break it down. Break what down? Parts of their body, like stuff that's fat. stored in their body. That's what do fat. they break down? Fat. They break down fat into? Sugar. If we measure somebody's blood sugar on day five of fast, are they going to have blood sugar? Yeah. How about day 25? Mm -hmm. Of course. Because if they don't have blood sugar, they're dead. They're dead. They've got blood sugar. Day 20 of a fast, they still have blood sugar. In fact, they still have normal blood sugar. How about if all they eat is fruit? Do they have blood sugar? Is it higher than anybody else's blood sugar? Not particularly. How about if the only thing you eat is protein powder? Do you have blood sugar? Of course. Or you're dead. And how about if you're an Eskimo living 200 miles north of the Arctic Circle, and the only thing you eat for nine months of the year is blubber and some meat. You've taken in zero carbs for nine months. Blubber and meat. Do you have blood sugar? Absolutely. Is it the same as everybody else's? Most likely. I only say nine months of the year because during the peak of summer, you can access the stomach contents of various animals, such as the reindeer, who eat the lichen. So a few times a year, you can have salad if you're living up there. <laughs> Salivating at the idea. <laughs> now, in the world of out there, we're told that if you have a candida problem, which has something to do with sugar somehow, that 
the thing to do is to stop eating sugar. In fact, stop eating complex carbohydrates as well because complex carbohydrates are some, you know, they're a form of sugar. So don't eat complex carbs and certainly don't eat simple carbs because that's going to beat out the candida. Where's the candida? In your blood. How would not eating carbs affect your blood sugar? It doesn't. How long do you have to stay on such a program? Forever. It's called the Candida program or the Candida diet. It's not called the anti-Candida diet. It's called the Candida diet <laughs> for a good reason. You're gonna be on it for a long time. It's always gonna be there because that won't beat out Candida. Inside your bloodstream, there's some sugar. But when you go to be active, getting sugar from your blood into your muscles takes longer than an athlete wants to wait when the gun goes off to start running. They want to go now, not, oh, let me get some sugar from my blood. It's got to transfer across the membrane of the blood vessel. That requires insulin. To get into the extracellular fluid from which it's now got to cross the membrane into the cell, that requires insulin. In order to be utilized by the cell for fuel. Saint Bolt already finished running. <laughs> we haven't left the blocks yet. If we're going to use blood sugar, we need sugar right now. Gun goes off. Sugar. When do you go? Anybody know when you go? When the gun goes off? Glycogen. It's called glycogen. What is glycogen? Glycogen is a complex carbohydrate that's available for use in the muscles immediately as sugar. We can get there and use it. What is the difference if glycogen is a complex carbohydrate but it's in your muscles? And starch is a complex carbohydrate in your food, why don't you just eat glycogen? What is glycogen? What's the difference? Scientists, nutritionists, professionals of all kinds don't really want you to understand what they do. They want to do it for you. In some ways, it's smart to have them do it for you. Let them be specialists. I'm not knocking them out front. But they don't want you really to know, and so we use two different words, glycogen and starch. Both are complex carbs. Turns out that glycogen is a complex carbohydrate found in animals, and starch is a complex carbohydrate found in plants. Other than that, there's no difference. They're all just complex carbs. You know, any more than it's called an enzyme if it's found in biochemistry, but if it's in physical chemistry, it's a catalyst. It allows the process to happen without getting involved. At the end of the process, you still have as much of it as you had at the beginning of it. So we use different names for the same thing, sort of uh, to confuse the innocent. Names are changed to confuse.
confusing.